Hello again, everyone. Neophyte DAG bringing you another message. And this is the continuation of my series on breaking the spells caused by shameless lies. And this deals with the warnings that were given in Job 9.24 and 1 Maccabees 3 verse 48. And we're going to cover in this message spell words. And what are spell words? These are words that cast a blindness over you on what the true meaning is for whatever it is you're reading or for whatever context in which these words were used. So someone uses these words hoping that you first you don't know the meaning and then you will not leave from what you're reading and go to another book to find the true meaning of those words. So let's get into uh, this message. So in reiterating Job 9 verse 24, it's a warning that was given to us because someone was able to see what was going to come in the future where a lot of our information will be hidden from us. And a lot of the people that were doing these creative things, these wonderful things, you know, whether it's in politics, socially, entertainment, you name it. We were in those areas, but everything got disguised because the, our pictures were painted over to match the image of the person who's going to rule over you for a certain period of time. So all your rulers, your leaders, your famous people were, lack of a better word, whitewashed. And to appear as someone else that isn't really the person that was doing all these things. So Job 9 tells you about that. Then 1 Maccabees 3 verse 48 again tells you, now this is related to the Bible itself, the book of law, the book of truth, that someone who is very ungodly, who is very wicked in nature, is going to paint over the image of your people to look like their people. So this is what Maccabees 3 verse 48, 1 Maccabees 3 verse 48 is telling you. Let's get into the spell word for today. The spell word is to whitewash or hide the truth in plain sight. Again, hoping that you won't look at that word any more further than you need to. Just see it, you pass over it, you're gone. But not leaving from the source that you see it in, jump to another source to find out what the true meaning of the, the word is. So the two words we're going to cover, and there are more of them, is swarthy and tawny because those two words have hidden a lot of your history you, you know these are small words but they hide a whole lot of history so keep repeating those words to yourself swarthy and tawny so what is swarthy what is the meaning of that normally when you see it you read over it you're going about your business you don't really you know, look too further into what it means. But what swarthy and how it's used, it's used to show the color of a person or something. So in looking at the meaning, you have to go back to the Webster Dictionary. And this is the 1828 Webster Dictionary that I'm pulling the word out of. So if you look at the word swarthy, it's down in the middle, but all these words, from one through uh, all the way down to the end, they're dealing with the same word, but just different variation of how it will be used. But for the most part, it all means the same. Being of a dark hue, a dusky complexion. So a hue again, it's a color. Being of a dark color, a dusky complexion. A dark com color of complexion or a dusky color of co complexion. That means it's someone's dark. They're not Caucasian. They're not what we call fair skin. They're not florid skin. They're not pale skin. They're a dark skin. And in today's word, how we'll use it is we'll say they're black. Or again, the word tawny again shows up in this. So someone who's swarthy can also be a tawny. And I'm reading from the swarthy meaning. So I'm, you know, almost middle of the uh, this this uh, page. So. Swarthy can also be tawny, 
and in reading some more, their swarthy person is in a warm, warm climate. The complexion of men is usually swarthy or black. The Moors, the Spaniards, the Italian are more swarthy than the French, German, and English. What, was, what does this mean? You know, uh, Spaniards are swarthy, Italians are swarthy, French are swarthy, Germans and English, this can't be. There's no swarthy people in those countries right now. But in 1828, when this meaning was being interpreted to you, they're telling you that the Moors, the Spaniards, and the Italians are more blacker than the French, German, and English. So hold on to that for a second, because I'm just throwing out food for thoughts. And then below that, it says <clears throat> black as swarthy Africans. So they're tying again the African into that color, being black and being swarthy. So that's a word that wherever it's pasted, if you don't stop to know that it means black, you'll skip over it and you'll miss your complete history of you or the person that history is talking about when it mentions the word swarthy. Because in most of the history that has been, you know, uh, put into books, they don't use blatant words such as black and this and that. They use these spell words to show the complexion without telling you that the person is black because again, you're not going to check beyond the word that you see swarthy to go figure out that it's black. And we all got caught into that spell word which erased a lot of our history because we don't go any further. So what we can take from this is swarthy is a dark skinned person, very dark, they're black, and as well as swarthy can be a tawny because if tawny is what from what we're going to go in it's another shade of dark skin tawny it's of a yellowish dark color so they're light skinned people what we call you know a high yellow person or a, a mulatto person and i don't like to use the word mulatto because it has another meaning to it but it's a light skinned person. They're a lighter complexion than the dark skinned person. And it can also say a person who has a sunburn to them is tawny. Again, a natural sunburned, not someone who, stand, you know, sort of lay out in the sun and try to get that tawny complexion, but someone who has that natural complexion. So a more, a Spaniard, the, the, the tawny sons, Again, when this time, at the time when this is written, keep in mind, the Spaniards were more and the Spaniards were tawny. Same as the French, the Italian, the English, and others that, again, as our message continue, we'll see clearly that the swarthy and tawny people were all over Europe. More. This is a word that we are very familiar with in our day and time because it's used quite often and it generally tie a group of people into a specific location, northern coast of Africa, but that is far from the truth. You're way outside of that in terms of dark skin color from what we're going to show in these messages on breaking the uh, spell you know, from these shameless lies. And this goes on, it tells you again in, as a more, you know, a dictionary description, dark complexion people. And this, they try to stick them in Northern Africa, but it goes beyond that. But this is the word that we're used to. So you'll see them used interchangeably in a lot of these historical documents, but, you know, don't be fooled. You know, and more goes way beyond the borders of Northern Africa. Now this is what the complexion code and spell words that are attached to them if you try to break it down from a color scheme. And we'll, most of the time that we're gonna spend, we're gonna spend it in the swarthy section where 
that's the skin tone, the skin color that's associated with the descriptions that you'll see in a lot of the books that you'll be reading that talks about history and what was happening, not in Africa, but within Europe, North America, and Northern Africa. And when I say Europe, I mean Western Europe, and to some extent, Central Europe, North Africa, North America, South America. You'll hear a lot of these spell words being used to cover up who the dark-skinned people are with these words that you see printed below the, the uh, color shades. So uh, a few of them, Tawny, Blackamore, Olive, Light Brown, Ruddy, Seguin, Moreno, that's a, the Spanish version of the spell word and Morena. And then for French, Bassane and Bassani. I might be messing up the French one, but these are the spell words that are used you know, the, the last four is what's used in Spain or for Spanish and what's used for French. And then the others, again, is the English spell words that are thrown out in various documents that you're going to come across that talk about people of color using these words to describe them rather than saying exactly who they are. And perhaps at the time when these words were being used, maybe that's the common thing to do. Maybe, maybe not, but whatever it's do, it, it was doing at the time, it's really disguising it, what it should mean at this current place in time. So take a look at this chart and you'll see color shades as you start going through documents and you pay attention to what shade or of complexion that the document is describing to you. Dusky. One of the spell words, partially dark or it's obscure. So again, we get back to the word uh, dark. And then in the second meaning of it, dark colored and not bright, of tending to, tending to blackness in color. So again, it's telling you it's a black or dark skin or brown skin description. Raven, this is what a raven looks like. This, this needs no dictionary description. Raven, this is the bird, it's a black bird. So again, if you hear someone says it's a raven complexion, you know that they're talking about a person of dark skin. Sable, it's another word. The meaning, black, dark, used chiefly in poetry. Again, they use this word to throw out sable complexion. And then if you don't check to know what sable is, you'll miss it. Okay, this is another one, Saturnine. If you look throughout the meaning, dark in coloring, that's what it means. Similar words, swarthy, dark. So it's telling you it's a swarthy or a dark in, in coloring. Muddy, of the color of mud, the fifth meaning, dark or of the color of mud. Again, comes back to the word dark again. If someone has a muddy appearance, a muddy complexion, they have a dark complexion. Mud has a brownish, a dark brownish color, and that's what the description is telling you. Ruddy. Ruddy is of bright yellow color as ruddy gold, so it's a yellowish complexion person, not pale, not fair skin, but of a yellowish complexion, closely tied to a tawny complexion. Olive, someone who has an olive complexion, it's generally referred to light or moderate brown, brownish or tan skin. So that's olive when you see someone has an olive complexion brown tannish skin goes back to tawny so they're tying you know they're tying together but they're just using different adjective to describe the same word sanguine reddish brownish color this ties back to the root more to the root race adam which is of red complexion and then the reddish complexion 
gets transitioned into a brownish, a dark skin complexion. But that's what the red is, a, red, a bright tone of red, sort of look like dry blood. That is the sanguine complexion. So reddish and brownish. Similar to sanguine is the mahogany color. It's a reddish or brown complexion. So a reddish brownish complexion. Again, this is a chart that we come back to. Know this chart very well as to what the skin tones are because it's going to be very important when you start reading about your history, not his history, but your history of where you are from, your people are from, and some of the things that your ancestors have done and put in place so you can know at this time that you were part of that. We have covered quite a bit of the spell words that are used to describe people of color, dark skin, brown skin, people. Now let's see how they're used in documents. This is a document that was written by Benjamin Franklin. Yes, that Benjamin Franklin, the famous you know, founder of the United States. He wrote a document back in the 1700s describing what was going on at that time in the 1700s, somewhere around 1755. So he, whatever he was seeing at that time, he wrote about it and he decided to publish it in, in a newspaper and again for prosperity that everyone at that time would know what his mindset was, what he was thinking. And then luckily for us now to be able to find this document and see exactly for ourselves a picture of what was happening during 1755. Let's take a look at what was happening in 1755 that was resting heavily on Benjamin Franklin's mind and that was perplexing him. So let's read from uh, item 24, which leads me to add one remark that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionately very small. Whoa, that's uh, that doesn't seem right. I mean, right now in our time, we're hearing that the whites cover the entire world and they're the, you know, the majority and everything else is the minority. So what's going on in 1755? Let's read further and see why he's saying that. All Africa is black or tawny. Here is the first use of the word tawny. What does tawny mean? Light skin, uh, black. So they're either, Africa is either black or light skin. Asia, chiefly tawny, mainly tawny, mainly light skin people. America, he's talking about America now, exclusive of the newcomers, which are them, the whites, are wholly so. They're wholly black or tawny. America was chiefly populated by black and tawny people. And in Europe, now he's moving to Europe, Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we call swarthy complexion. You gotta be kidding me. Is that what he's really saying? Was he making a mistake? No, he wasn't. He was interpreting what he was seeing at that time. Europe was occupied by swarthy complexion people in the majority, as are the Germans also. So the Germans as well, we're gonna throw them in because again, there. when you think of Germany, you think all whites. When you think of Swedes, you think all whites. When you think of Russia, all whites and all the other countries, you know, but it was not the case in 1755. They were all swarthy, dark skinned complexion people that ruled those countries and most of Europe. Where did they go? Did they pack up and leave? Did they teleport to another planet? We'll find out in further uh, messages 
where did these people go or where did they were sent off to? So, but going back to what he's saying, Benjamin Franklin, Europe, the main players in Europe are all countries of dark skin complexion people who are controlling those countries. So this is one of the most important documents that you're going to come across that will place a timeline and what was going on in terms of the race relationship in America and in Europe. And as you can see in America, the most of the people were of black or tawny complexion. And then in Europe, the majority of the Western European countries were of dark skin complexion. That's what I want you to get from this document written by Benjamin Franklin. Now, in using that, we're going to we're going to measure one person based on our, the new words, spell words that we have found that were being circulated during that time, which is in the 1700. Very likely, it was being used in the 1600s, and it was being used in the 1500s, and all the way back to the 1400s. If we want to dig back into Columbus's time. We're going to look at William Shakespeare, the famous poet, playwright, Macbeth, Othello, you know, all those famous plays were written by him. He was the most popular playwright in England during his time. Let's take a look to see who William Shakespeare is and was. In looking at and trying to find who he is, uh, you have to go through what we call primary sources and secondary sources. And secondary sources are usually someone else wrote it. They weren't really there, but they had a good idea, a good conjecture, a good feeling as to what was going on at that time. And that's a secondary source. Then you have the primary, either written by the person themselves, someone close to them at that time, are written by someone who is of scholarly standing that is very credible to render his or her findings on that particular subject. So we're pulling from a book, the, which is the biography of Shakespeare written by Peter Aykroyd. And on page 381, Peter mentioned that this is the description that's given of Shakespeare, that, and if you check the highlighted area, he is of a muddy or swarthy complexion. Again, if we don't check any further to say what, what is really muddy and what's really swarthy, especially if they had stricken out the muddy and just left swarthy, we would have said, well, you know, what is that? That's probably another term that they're calling white people because again, the picture I just showed you, Shakespeare was a white person. It's totally white. That's where history history.com has him as that picture that he's white. But in digging further into his biography, there is a indication that he's muddy or of swarthy complexion. And from what we know with swarthy, it's dark skin. Let's not stop there. Let's dig a little further. This is what Shakespeare picture looks like on various credible, reputable sites. Now, does this person look swarthy to you? Swarthy is of dark skin. Whoever this painting is, this is not dark skin. This is pale skin. And I would even take it to fair skin. But the way it's lighted up, I would say it's more pale skin. So obviously, there's some painting over going on as we had mentioned in Job and First Maccabees, that there's your people are being changed into the likeness of those who have conquered you and your history is being erased right in front of your eyes. Let's look at another biography written about Shakespeare. This is by Peter Quinnell. And let's do some associations of Shakespeare. 
Shakespeare had a mistress. He wrote a poem about her. Uh, the poem is famously known as a dark lady. She was the object of his love. He had loved her and he wrote a poem, a very nice poem to her. And he talked about her a lot. Now, Lucy, which she was called, and she was called a Negro. And from other messages that I've put out, you see Negro deals with the line of Shem that were called or categorized as Negro. So anywhere you see Negro, don't throw them in Africa under the Hamite, the Hamite section, Central or Southern Africa. It's more Northern Africa and Europe, Western Europe and some parts of Central Europe and North America. That's where the Negroes resided on the global map. But Lucy the Negro celebrated for her dark complexion. So Shakespeare's mistress's girlfriend was of dark complexion. So again, yes, it could be a white guy and he likes dark skinned women. All right, we'll see. But from our first biographer, we saw that he was of dark, muddy complexion. The girlfriend is dark skinned. Continuing on Peter Quinnell's biography of Shakespeare, you'll see that on page 284, there's a lot of things going on during Shakespeare time. You know, we're talking about, you know, racial prejudice, you know, uh, being a Jew, uh, you know, anti-Semitism, and all sorts of different things that were going on in Shakespeare life that he was bringing out in his plays. And in looking at the beginning where it says, uh, the Othello pigmentation also differ as to the effect that is, is African blood. So the African blood of Othello ties in with the African blood of Shakespeare. He's writing himself in his character, his own consciousness of it. Shakespeare is conscious of his African blood and it's being put into Othello's pigmentation. So that's one way he's bringing out himself. Shakespeare is writing about himself buried in his character. Then it talks about the uh, Elizabethans who were, again, had this anti-Semitism going on. And what is anti-Semitism? It's being a prejudice against Semitics. And in my previous message, you see who are the Semitic people, people of dark skin complexion, the brown race. So there was a lot of that going on at that time in Shakespeare life. And also that leads to racial prejudice. So that was a big part of his life that he kind of worked into the characters. There's another character that he put into the Merchant of Venice. The character, one of the character is a Jew. Why is he putting in a Jew? You'll see that in a little bit, why Shakespeare is tying relationship of Jews in his play. And then he put one of the characters, a Moor, Moorish prince. Again, he's pulling in all these different characteristics of himself in his plays and bring brought through in his character. One of the other character in uh, <clears throat> in his play is a, you know, a person of dusky coloring of his skin. So again, dusky from a, what we pulled in that meaning, that spell word meaning dark skin again. And then further down, you know, one of the uh, Venetian senator had hesitated to employ him because his face was dark. So he's pulling in all these features of Shakespeare into this writing here and tying it in with the characters Shakespeare was writing about in all his famous plays. Now, does this person fit all this dark characteristic? Let's sum this person up. This person here, he's white, he's writing all these wonderful things in his plays about dark skinned people and he goes out dating dark-skinned girls, and he's doing all these things which are benefiting dark-skinned people just for his generosity. Doesn't seem likely during that time where, where there was this anti-black sentiment, anti-Semitism 
sentiments, racial prejudice going on where one person who is of this pale skin complexion championing all these things in his plays about dark skin folks. This is not Shakespeare and what he looks like. This is the painted over image of Shakespeare. Now, let's hear from Shakespeare himself as to who he is at the time of his birth all the way up until his death. This is from the autobiography of Shakespeare. And what the autobiography is, it's something written by the person themselves. So it's not a biographer who comes in later and may or may not know Shakespeare and may be second guessing from other sources, but this is from the horse's mouth. This is what Shakespeare said himself. So in the beginning of the biography, his autobiography, he says, I remember my father, Richard Shakespeare of Warwick. He was a small, dark man. So his father is dark. He's telling you that, whoa, that's one thing again, leading us back to this road as to who Shakespeare is. His father is dark. Even if his father went out and impregnated a pale skin, fair skin, Caucasian woman, Shakespeare would still be dark skin, would still be a dark skin complexion person, a swarthy, either light or dark skin. So he's telling you his father was dark. Let's read on. Now Shakespeare's talking about himself. On page 57 at the bottom, he said, I, a small, dark man with great eyes. So again, he's telling you what he, what he is. He's small and he's dark, dark complexion man. And then he went on further. They called me, they called me a little Jew boy. Whoa, that means he's a Jew as well, which is tying back into you're a Semitic, you have a dark skin race. And then the Semitics were a Jew of the line of Jacob, of the line of Abram. Jew, dark skin. So contrary to what you have been told about who a Jew is and who Shakespeare is, no, it's not true. Shakespeare was dark, and if he's dark and he's a Negro, within the center of the earth, the middle area of the earth, then that makes him part of the Jew, the tribe of Abraham, tribe of Jacob. He's one of the 12 tribes. So he's a dark man and he's a Jew. Then also further down, he's talking about his grandfather his grandfather is Thomas the Little of Utrecht. I might be you know, messing up that name, but what I want to point out that that was in Holland. So that is, it's in Netherlands. So in Netherlands, again, there was another black man in Netherlands, a dark skinned man, his Shakespeare grandfather, and he was also born a Jew. So these countries, even though Benjamin Franklin didn't mention Holland, but yes, Holland, Netherlands is part of the area that was predominantly ruled by dark skin, swarthy skin people. This is from Shakespeare himself telling you who he is and for us who he was. He was a small, dark skin man. Again, does this person, this picture looks like a dark skinned man? And I'm going to keep asking because I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure this is driven home to you that the images are painted over. So if you had any doubt as to what Job and First Maccabees is saying, hopefully this is helping to clear up those doubts because this is not a dark skin swarthy skin person. It's certainly not the, the coloring of it. There's, this is another source 
that you can go and find accurate information about any of the famous persons that were in Europe and to some extent America, North America in the later part. They don't do much lying in this book. This is where a lot of the, lot of the truth is because we weren't given access to these books until now. So we never knew where to go and find these books to pull out accurate descriptions of who these people were. So it's a national dictionary of all the biography of famous people. And it's in, I think about 60 something volume. It goes from people names starting with A all the way down to Z. So in volume, in this volume, it talks about Shakespeare. Let's see what it has to say. So this is the page itself, page 385, and what I've done, I've pulled out that excerpt, Portraits and Memorial, and I've blown it up over here on the right-hand side so you can read along with me. This is telling you of the portraits and the memorabilia of Shakespeare. Only two existing portraits can be regarded as fully authenticated, meaning it's real, it's not any fake stuff. And the word extant means existing, because I, again, I don't want any words to fly over your head where you don't know it. And the first one is telling you is the bust, meaning a statue pillar of Shakespeare in the Stratford church. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. So there's an image of him at the Stratford church. And here's what they tell you further on about other images. Images the bust attributed to Gerard Johnson. He is another person who made an image of Shakespeare. But later on, let's see what happened. It was originally colored, so it had the coloring, the right coloring. But in 1793, Malone caused it to be whitewashed. So, in their own words, they're telling you what's going on. But at this point, we weren't privy, we weren't given access to these books in completeness for you to see, but they have given themselves roadmap on how they can find their way back to their own truth as how they wanted to create it, and then to the real truth, which was what was and what is. So it was whitewashed. Goes back to what? Job is saying in 1 Maccabees that your people's image will be whitewashed to look like those who conquered them. So they were black, they were washed into a white color. Now this is what the bust at Stratford Church looks like. And as you can see, it's a dark skinned person one might make the argument saying, well, he's white, but you know, the, 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 the statue aged. No, it's not. The color of the statue did not age. It looks still white. The cuffs are still white. Even the pen is white and the paper. Look at the paper in comparison to his hands. It is a dark skinned person. No matter which way you slice it, he told you he's dark. His biographers told you he's dark. Then you go back to his biography in the National Dictionary of Biography, and it's telling you this is the only authenticated statue of Shakespeare that exists. And why is it authenticated? It was put together by someone who respected Shakespeare with the permission of Shakespeare's wife at the time, which was a dark skinned woman, of course. And she went to this church along with Shakespeare when he was alive, and she would not have walked past a white statue pretending to be her husband when she knew who her husband looked like and what complexion he was of. So this is the bust that's there at the Stratford Church showing the depiction of a dark skinned Shakespeare who he really was. This is another book, the, the one by Peter Quinnell that I read from. This is the cover of the book itself. I had saved that for last to show you that Peter Quinnell in his biography of Shakespeare knew that Shakespeare was a brown, dark skin, swarthy complexion person. And the person on the right 
well fitting of the shameless lies is not the complexion of Shakespeare. That is a total, absolute, shameless depiction of a person of color who is swarthy complexion being replaced or washed over with a pale skin, uh, you know, a fair skin person. Not Shakespeare, the fair skin. Shakespeare is the truth, which is on the left. Once more, here's the image of Shakespeare, a dark skinned man, as known by his family and friends. That's the image on the left. And the image on the right, that's a shameless lie of Shakespeare being a pale skinned person as portrayed in this image. What I want you to take away from this are a few things. Europe was populated by dark skinned people in high number. We controlled, we had dominance, and we had esteem presence all over Europe. And that secondly, once we lost that high esteem, that high status in Europe, our images, our history, who we are was erased or whitewashed. That's really what I want you to get out of this, to know that your history is much stronger than what you think. It's only that it was hidden, taken away, and whitewashed wherever possible. Keep that in mind always to know who you really are. And I'll keep bringing that out in more and more information that I'll make available so we all can find our way back to who we are and who we were. This brings us to the end of this message, and I want you to take away from this that you and your people, your ancestors, your forefathers and mothers were a big part of Europe, Western Europe, Central Europe, and that their history was categorically whitewashed by the other race that had moved into Europe and had taken over as the majority. So. Take this information and break the spell because there's a lot more spell that has been cast and in peeling away the layers that were cast on us, we'll get to the truth and certainly we'll get to the truth together. With that, take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful and blessed day.